Great. So yeah. Well, Daniel, do you want me to record this as well in gallery view? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Uh, okay. You've got to co-host me. There we go. That should be recording. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a little group of us today. Welcome. It's nice to, to get together and sort of dive into another AI and us conversation. Um, I think we can we can pretty much dive straight in in a second. I think that it'll be neat to see kind of what mode we're in. The conversation uh, primer that we discussed this time around was the White House's offering around um, what a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights might look like. Um, but as with all of these, that's a seed, and whatever conversation emerges is really fine. We take it where we where we want to go and, and stick with where our where our heart and our experience is uh, over over just sort of the, the cerebral piece. Um, uh, and again, of course, I'm I'm Daniel from Thamazo and Brenda from from the village, and uh, and we've been enjoying putting putting these events together, and then working working with uh, with Carissa to get the the in person events happening. Um, before we dive in, Brenda, is there anything that you would like to uh, to say? And we'll do a little introduction round. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, no. <laughs> no, because I'm ready for the discussion. Um, but anything to add? What you just said was perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, and I love, you know, even though um, each of our little configuration has met, doing an introduction is kind of like doing a painting again and again of the same thing. There's always different little facets and nuances that come out with each time we introduce ourselves. Uh, so yeah, I'll open things up for uh, just a brief introduction to like, who are you and what brings you into this space right now? Um, and I'll leave a moment of silence for someone to join uh, to, to, to sort of start it with a popcorn and then we'll we'll work our way around the screen. Okay, I'll take it. Um, so I'm Brenda Kiesel and um, I care deeply about people. And I care deeply about healing and very deeply about creativity and expression and connection. Um, I feel as if, you know, I was born, I always said I was born a writer, but um, now I call myself an artist and a love activist. And um, because as I have uh, evolved over the many years. I uh, have continued to explore all different kinds of uh, things and uh, feelings and formats and medias. And um, I have found myself very, very drawn to technology for its ability to connect and unite us. Um, the irony and the paradox and the pain is that it does, you know, that all sounds great, <clears throat> but it also has um, evolved into something tremendously um, destructive and, um, and disruptive. And um, while it also has so many, um, you know, almost unimaginable advantages and uh, gifts that it can bring us. So I'm really sort of both, like so many of us, very drawn to the tools, uh, very repelled by the violence and the myths and disinformation and all the potential for evil doing that, uh, that it has. And uh, so I'm really, really happy to have this forum here to talk about it, um, share our feelings, thoughts, reflections, fears, and grow community around it. Uh, and I do believe that growing community is really one of the most important things in our world now, when we are so, we are so phenomenally technologically connected and yet so emotionally, psychologically disconnected from ourselves and each other. Lots of work to do, lots of fun ahead. 
Lovely. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> How about uh, Nick? Do you want to go? Sure. Um, I'm uh, I'm Nick. I'm sometimes sort of see myself as like a wounded artist. Um, and I often find myself wondering about um, systems on a scale that's on the scale that's that I know we're not smart enough to fully comprehend. So, you know, um, like the no sphere or to what extent are people in all ecology, some kind of meta organism is the sun, a conscious being, what, what is the universe? You know, well, you know, there's all this stuff going on. That's kind of beyond the intellect of our, our primate brains or minds. Um, yet I think we have the capacity to interface with, um, those scales. And I think a lot of the mystic traditions, um, are about insights into what's going on, on the, on these scales that are larger than us, um, or, um, more meta than our, our thinking minds. So I think a lot of that, um, you know, then I'm very concerned about what's happening to people in the environment and like the oceans and all this stuff that is sort of flirting with going very wrong. Um, and is definitely in the realm where a lot of people and, and beings are suffering. Um, and meanwhile, I'm, you know, Nick, the wounded artist who can also just fall into all my selfishness and whatnot. Um, so here we are on the cusp of maybe things going really well, maybe things going in a very harmful direction. How do we pull together and, and um, to what extent can we steer where things are going? And I agree, Brenda, that it's, I think, small groups of people working together in caring ways um, will probably be a major factor um, if if things can steer towards social ecological resilience and wellness. Uh, I think small groups working together uh, will be will be a big factor. And I think it usually that's <laughs> or a lot of the other meaningful movements in history. And it, you know, and well, my little pet peeve is an aside. I keep hearing these technologists talk about the things the printing press did, or how many people vaccines have saved. And I'm like, well, well, yeah. Except you have to remember, like the hundreds of thousands of activists who like put their lives on the line to make those things happen, right? The technology was just a little. It was always a small part of those equations. Like the printing press didn't bring us democracy. Um, like people. People worked really hard to bring us democracy um, and democracy, egalitarian democracy has arisen in societies that weren't literate. Um, anyway, here we are. Um, my word for the week is hutagogy, self-directed learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the exciting things the last couple of weeks is I found, uh, I don't know if you heard of Andy um, Metaschuk. Um, he was the head of research and development at Khan Academy for a while, you know, which was after he was uh, executive at uh, Apple uh, as, a, as a designer and engineer. Um, but at Khan Academy, he did extensive research in the memory and integrated learning. And now he's been a, uh, a self-funded researcher into, um, into learning, space repetition, and um, just a whole lot of theory of how, how people learn and when learning becomes integrated, when learning um, when learning allows people to think in really flexible ways and allows them to apply learning in meaningful ways. And wow, the stuff he writes and just him as a curious, he's just awesome. So I'm in the middle of like taking his stuff and trying to condense it so that I can feed it into chat GPT and code interpreter and then like improve my flashcards and all of that. And it's really quite a ride. So that's where I'm at. Hi. Yeah, and you know, I'm 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 Daniel, and uh, and for me, um, as as you were saying, Nick, I really I find myself in that place of um, it feels like we're at such an I mean, the crossroads doesn't even cut it because that's so binary, and it's just we're in this deeply 
complicated space of potentiality where there's so many different what it makes me think of most is sort of the tibetan book of the dead where we've got these different different areas of pull and of gravitation into very different worlds that we can end up kind of emerging from where we're at um and i think it's fascinating looking at how tools like i mean and even saying tools like ai looking at something like an llm and saying like we don't we don't really have other tools like this right now it's something that we haven't we haven't encountered something quite like this before. Seeing how they fit into the mix is key. Um, but but as with as with the, the Book of the Dead, so much of it is about like how do we be present and how do we notice where are my motivations coming from and how do we move into that place of essentially individualized non-attachment um, so that we're able to try to discern clearly where to go um, and maybe let our curiosity and our hope and our vision move us more than our fear and our greed um, and the other elements that so readily shape our technology and that we have a lot of momentum going in that direction around how do we shape our technology um yeah like 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 you both were saying i think for me that piece around around love connection community starting from there and and then moving out into what what comes next is uh is just critical for me and i really have been valuing this community and these calls and the different other ways that we've been engaging um that really seem to put that human connection center first and then say how does that inform the choices that we make and even how does that just um reveal the choices that we make <laughs> that often are so implicit that we don't recognize that we're making choices about things um so it's it's wonderful to be on this kind of a journey with folks as as thoughtful as you in in what that can look like um zach feel free to jump in again feel free not to if you're in a space where that's uh, where that's infeasible and like i said we we sort of we've chosen the um the uh, White House Bill of Rights kind of idea as a starting place for today. I'll throw into here just to kind of seed it um, on the on the chat here that the five key areas that they talked about were safe and effective systems, algorithmic discrimination protections, data privacy, notice and explanation, and human alternatives consideration and fallback. One thing that I uh, I only after having sent the other one out saw a great article talking about you know the agreement that Biden and seven of the different companies have come to around sort of non-binding approaches that they're going to try to take towards ethics was that it it left out very strongly anything around transparency and anything around having things like here's the exact uh data that we have trained our models on uh, which of course is critical to a vast number of those other parts especially around safe and effective systems and algorithmic discrimination protections being able to actually know and access what what is it that has informed the way that this model is going to work is uh is so key but anyways i'm gonna i'm gonna step back for a second to see whether it's based off of that rights piece or it's just what's alive for you right now around this whole realm what uh, what what comes up for any of y'all well um you know as i read it i always take notes when i watch these videos or or read the posts um the first thing that i wrote is um you know when I was in university, I studied uh, film production and um, uh, I took a, I had to do some elective, whatever. I chose to take a, a course in uh, critical viewing skills. Um, and, you know, as a filmmaker, I don't need it so much because I know what happens, you know, behind what's going on on screen. Uh, so it's very easy for me um, to understand that. But I realized that uh, I think that we need to teach critical viewing and critical thinking skills, uh, not via AI, but human to human, for, you know, at the beginning of our schooling. So maybe not kindergarten, but elementary school 
all through high school and university. I think it should be mandatory um, because, you know, when I read uh, uh, this post, I coming out of the White House, I, I felt like you're not talking about how to educate us um, because, you know, and, and, and it, it, it scares me in a way because I think that, you know, uh, it's not easy for me to read that document, which was very well written um, and as probably as concise as it can be. But what about, you know, people who have less education? What about people who aren't writers uh, and, and voracious readers? Uh, who's going to, and, and even though they kept saying, uh, you know, they use this expression, plain language documentation often saying, you know, make sure that you let your public know in plain language what's going on, you know, but I think that even plain language can be complex. And so I'm worried about how, how all of this not only will be um, deployed, but how it will be understood, uh, communicated to and understood by the public at large. So, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I thought, I mean, I had nothing to really compare it to. I'm not in the habit of reading documents like this, but I thought, okay, it's a start for sure. And I could see, uh, you know, the layers and the richness of it. And of course, I have some sense, uh, though small that it may be, of the vastness of what they have to tackle, you know, trying to regulate something that's already way out of the box, you know, something that's been, you know, going on. Now they're going to coming back and saying, okay, now we need to regulate. But it's not just regulate what already exists. It's like, how do you regulate artificial superintelligence that's growing exponentially, that's growing in a way that we don't, we can't even fathom, or at least I can't fathom. So, you know, so deep, deep concerns. And I guess that's where. I think about, um, you know, education and teaching critical uh, thinking, viewing skills, also listening, teaching people to listen. I mean, there's just a lot. And then, I mean, I don't know if I should just throw it all out right now. Should I or should I wait for my next thing, which is? <laughs> I trust your gut, whichever, whichever feels right. Okay, if you guys have anything to add to what I've just said, go for it. If you don't, then I'll go to the next thing that's that's on my mind. Well, actually, I'll, there are two things popped up in my head. One was that while I agree that, um, and you might already agree with this, but that um, teaching critical thinking, critical viewing, um, I agree with the, as a vision, I want to be in a society where that happens, um, but it doesn't strike me as a plan. I don't see how we're going to kind of go around to the top because it's so systemic the way that school currently works. And we'd have to like replace all <laughs> the people at the top with enlightened people for it to trickle down and be that way. So while I want to get to a society that behaves that way, I think we need to start things at the bottom that are kind of viral. Um, that spread, you know, create tools that that are gamified, that are really fun to work with, that give people, help people develop their critical thinking skills and motivation for applying them, that Fine. then spreads um, and that it will spread. And with luck, it will eventually get to the decision makers or people who have important nodes within systems. And then it'll transform society. And then it'll be like, oh, we need to, teach, you know, we should just, have, we should just change our schools. <laughs> But um, don't you think now, Nick, sorry to interrupt, but don't you think now uh, attention is the gateway? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Don't you think that it's already happening, that education is being completely upended by AI, that now might be the time as we, we are being literally forced uh, because of large language models, et cetera, we're, lit we're literally being forced to reimagine education? I, I do think so. And I'm not saying we can't convince people in education to start implementing ideas. I, I just think the plan for that to happen, I think will look like starting on in 
not starting with things that can just spread outside of the schools where they'll prove themselves as they spread. Uh, and meanwhile, advocating for change within the system. But what I've seen is most teachers are almost everybody I've talked to, they're, they're very resistant um, and they're not necessarily, uh, and they don't quite know how these things work. So I think it's going to be a very slow for decision makers in education to, um, to learn what's happening and learn how these things can change. And they're going to be resistant to it. And there will be um, people who are more open and more, you know, like I follow Ethan Mullick, um, who is a, he's an educator at one of the big universities and his, the things he's writing. Um, but I think he also sees that in education, he's seeing a lot of resistance. So yes, we will find people. And they will be like, okay, let's try to do this. But I think the fo the forefront, the zeitgeist, is going to be at the grassroots level. Um, and I think that that's where the best place to plan for change is to think grassroots first. Um, and then, as that happens, how will we find our allies within decision makers within systems? Um, and as for the the plain language, what struck me. Um, that um, uh, just that we have a situation where, where you know, inflection. They've just built a supercomputer that's about forty times more powerful than the one that OpenAI used to train uh, GPT four. And the tool, they're all they're going to be one step ahead of government, and you know, like they'll be like, great, right. <laughs> write a plain language description of how this meets all these things and protects everybody and make, make it all very convincing. Um, and they'll, you know, I think, you know, the bill of rights is some of the language is good, but I think we all know that the, the companies that are most of concern will have the best tools for like crafting language in a way that meets their needs. Um, and I don't see how government's going to be able to, you know, like the the people, those companies also can pay like the, you know, $50 billion salary, you know, the salaries that will get them the best people. Um, so that's kind of what we're up against is the fact that by the nature of what's happening, uh, skill with language, um, these companies have an advantage that, um, uh, yeah. Um, anyway. It seems to me like, I mean, and I'll start from there and then go backwards, but that someone surfaced at the at the, the previous in-person event that we had, you know, one of the other key parts is that policy moves slow and that that's by design and that that's, it's good in many ways that policy moves slow, um, but the challenge is that this is a field where that just utterly doesn't get served well by that. And that when you have the combination of something that moves slow and that often the people who it, who have the critical say in how those policies get set don't necessarily have the familiarity or expertise with what the technologies actually are um, that, that can help inform that. And when you then have, as you were saying, Nick, very nimble and very resourced organizations who, you know, in the, the image that's in my mind is, is actually glacial of sort of a glacier of like, well, here's, we're gonna close these loopholes at some point um, but then you have these nimble little creatures that are able to say, well, okay, great. Well, here's the one that we have right now. And the split second that one closes, you know, we have the tools to just find, well, here's the next one that we can use, or here's the ways that we can work with the process in order to make sure that advocacy that is most conducive to the uses that we're wanting to make of things uh, is, uh, is in place. Um, so it's tricky. On the, on the side around education, I really do think that, uh, and especially both around that critical thought piece and just how these tools are used, um, at least what my what my experience has been a bunch with the education system is a piece of it is that grassroots piece, but that maybe the interface is often, there's the piece that's the interface to the decision makers around education, but then there's the piece of support and spotlighting, like where are the innovators, where are the creators, the, teach, the, the individual teachers who are doing something that's novel and clearly effective, um, especially important because 
sometimes they aren't finding themselves in uh, a, a system, be that at the school or at the district level that supports that work. Uh, I mean, some, some are very lucky and they do, but having that strong community voice to say, here's some people doing really neat work. It's, it's positive, it's good, it's forward thinking. Let's, let's see more of that. Um, helps support those people to do more of what it is that they're doing. Um, and, and I think that that part's really, really critical around it as well. The, the image that came to mind, uh, sorry, not image, but the, the item um, was, um, you probably know this one, Brenda, but the, the Merchants of Cool, which again, this is for the previous era of, of media, um, but it was, it was a fantastic thing when being young and having our youth group leader show us that and that then becoming a resource that we used again and again with different youth around just helping people understand here's how images, here's how narrative is constructed and here's how it's aimed strategically to get you to do certain things um, and helping people build those building blocks of understanding what that looks like. And I think it'll be interesting. We're at such a naive state right now, generally around AI um, and again, when I say AI right now, I mean large language models, um, but getting to that point where people can interact with a large language model system and be able to tease out, well, here's stuff that's probably biased from the material that was given to it. And here's stuff that is probably related to the guardrails that were imposed, um, however effectively or not by the organization whose AI I'm interacting with. Um, and here's the pieces that are simply the nature of the beast of what a large language model is. And here's the pieces that I've introduced as either bias or as different approaches from how I'm engaging and interacting with it. Um, I think we have, we have a, a long road to go <laughs> before we're at a place of that level of, of prompt literacy uh, and, and understanding what, what that dialogue with these things looks like. Um, but it's interesting to think about. Yeah, the other piece, though, uh, on the flip side, on the one side, we have the large companies that are able to very quickly um, react to and formulate um, strategy. But we also have a really neat tool now that helps um, for someone who, you know, as you were saying, Brenda, someone who isn't necessarily, they're not necessarily a writer. They aren't someone who's necessarily passionate about reading long, complex articles about something or other. We also in this tool have something that's able to start to help people say like from this perspective, like if I'm thinking from a, a um, equity and power hierarchy um, frame, what are some of the questions that come to mind from this article? And there's, there's some very, I, th I think that the, the, the bar one has to jump over in order to access some of the, the thinking around the stuff that we have to think about um, is maybe getting a little bit better. Um, I think, Nick, of some of the ways that you've been using um, the the tools in your in your educational work as well, of just being able to use some of the tools to help say, okay, well, what else is a part of this terrain? What else is a part of this topology? What should I be should I be thinking about and learning about um, that that isn't necessarily the the narrow spray that is that is directed at me. Okay. How are you guys feeling? I, you know, it's funny. At one point there, I, I realized um, that I was feeling tense. And then, uh, and then I checked in with like how, uh, how much I appreciate uh, you guys. <laughs> and then that, uh, and then I thought, okay, that I, like this morning I got up and started reading the Bill of Rights right away. And um, it reminded me that better if I get up and do like a, a heart practice. Um, Cause otherwise it all gets interpreted in maybe not the best way. So thank you uh, uh, all of you guys for being an inspiration for that realization. Daniel, Daniel, how are you, you know, to me, I see you as a human version of an LLM, and I wonder, I want to tap into the heart here. How are you feeling? The, the, and I don't mean in general, I mean yeah. now, through the this. The feeling that's there for me while engaging in this topic right now, um, what it's most akin to is being a teenager 
riding in a parking lot, lying down on a skateboard and the feeling of like, there's exhilaration and there's interest and there's danger. And where's the level of sort of, do I need to slow down or am I learning the stuff that I need to be learning at a pace that's all right, that I'm probably not going to break my knees or something or other. Um, so that mixture, this real feeling of there's, there's the piece that's around excitement. There's a piece around an awareness of that need for presence and, and a feeling of, of both seen and unseen risks in this whole terrain, but that that not being a reason to not engage with it. Um, so that's, that's, that's the best sort of memory back into a similar feeling that comes to mind to where we're at, to where I'm at right now in, in both in this conversation and more generally in this overall um, sort of domain that we're exploring. Mixed with, mixed with the, high, the extra high stake part that it's not just that individual part, but that this is, I mean, it feels so much like societally, I mean, one path that we may be going down is one of dissolution and imaginal like approach to what's coming next. Um, however, we want to kind of read that. And that I feel like there's so much of that that has to do with with presence and intent and just being able to stay present and to recognize, and I think that's the thing, and tools like this and our dominant societal mode amplify the feeling of what we need to do is figure it out. We need the, I mean, even the name of this document, Blueprint for Approach to Rights. And it's this idea of like, I just need my brain to be big enough and we need all of our big brains to fit together in a way to fix it and figure things out. And that it's it's sort of like the yellow submarine kind of a piece of like, you know, it's not that you bang against the bubble to sort of pop it, it's the gentle approach that's needed. And that what we really need to be doing is just getting as present as possible and noticing like, how does any of this make me feel? And what's the impact of any of this? And I don't need to know what the 30 next steps are that we need to do as a master plan, but like, what, what is it right now? And Nick kind of relate, related to that gratitude that you're feeling like I really do feel like my experiences with this group both again both online and in person is being to, able to have a little bit of that grounding place so that when I find myself zooming off in a given direction having that wisdom of the group to hear like where are other people at um, and what is what's the stuff that's most alive and present for them helps me ground back into the present of like oh yeah what's what's here right now and what's the next step how about you? So I remember, so it was, we just had the 10 year anniversary of my father's death. And a um, couple of weeks before he died, something happened. And so we had to call an ambulance and I, I ran to, to his place and was in the ambulance with him. My parents were slated to go to their friends, Rona and Morley's that night for supper. And there was gonna be a few other friends there. And my dad was, you know, at that point on home dialysis and really not, he was going down. You know, we didn't quite know how close though I sensed it. Um, so we're in the ambulance and, um, you know, my father's, super super smart guy and uh but like a little bit confused which is so unusual um and he's lying there and they're like tending to him and everything and at a certain point he looks at me and I will never forget the look in his eyes like the just the the life in his eyes and the warmth in his eyes looking at me and he said well maybe if things are okay we could make it to Rona and Morley's for dessert I just thought, wow, dad, that is fucking incredible. You know, like the, the human desire to live, to be alive, even when you're feeling like shit and you're really close to death, you know, he still wanted to taste it. He still wanted to feel it. And so, and I, this is all improvised here, uh, me telling you the story and, and you know, and I'm not sure even how to weave it, except something that is rising up in me um, as I 
explore more and more about LLMs, but also, you know, AI in general, I think about us humans and I think about all the extraordinary strides that we have made, for example, in the science, in the, in the health sciences and, you know, more and more lives will be made better. More and more lives will last longer. More and more lives will be saved. And I think, what's it all about? You know, is it that we really just don't want to die? <laughs> you know, is it that we really just don't want to die? Why does what, you know, I say to myself, well, Brenda, you know, if you're a partner, if Ned was like on his, you know, you know, was in an accident or something happened, I would sure be thrilled for anything that technology can throw at him to save his life, not only save his life, but allow him to have a good life. Um, but at the same time, we die, like no matter what. Now, maybe in the future, we won't, you know, though, I, I don't think I'd want to be around for that. I feel like the fact that there's an end game makes life so much more precious and immediate. And, you know, you, you mentioned the word greed before, Daniel, you know, I think about fear of death. I think about greed. We are so greedy. We can never get enough. We always want more. And even when we have so much, we still want more. When, you know, and here, you know, we can talk about being in the West and what that means, but like for a lot of the world, they don't have the privilege that we have here. I, I try and I'm trying to understand from a lay person, I'm not a technologist, you know, but the human heart is my field of study. And I'm trying to understand why we are propelling ourselves in this way and why we have created technology that actually can be our undoing. And it, you know, if I talk about it here, I feel like, well, you know, some host you are, you know, you could, what a bummer. You know, I've no, I know that there's been times that I've said things and I've said, you know, pretty, pretty scary or negative things about how I'm feeling. And I think, wow, am I the only one? And I know I'm not. I know most of us are kind of terrified as even as we are exhilarated to use your word, Daniel, and inspired. Um, I think that I don't know if it's possible for, you know, a lot of us to heal. And when I say heal, I mean our traumas, our wounds. Because I really think that 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 are that there's a hole somehow inside of our humanity. And I'm not talking about spirit and collective spirit. I'm talking just about like what makes us human, the meat, as Jeanette Winterson would say, the meat package. You know, like I imagine as I continue to allow my healing in my own life, you know, I just, I just wonder what this world would be like if we talked more about healing. And I know that there's more and more talk about healing, but actually not even so much talk about it, but more finding our ways to and through it and then see what would happen to this world. That then see if we would be less hungry, less needy, less violent to ourselves and to each other. Um, you know, we watch these. I mean, I'm so excited and can't wait until we talk about the uh, the writers and actors strike in Hollywood right now. I think that's really, really, really important and kind of a a lightning rod for what's to come you know, or for the potential of what's to come for people to rise up and say, no, fucking no, this is not fair. You know, we look at the billionaire class, we look at the multimillionaires and we wonder and we question and more and more of what is actually going on with them is, 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 is coming out. And I'm excited by that too. Although I don't know if the people who need to see it are seeing it or enough of the people who need to see that are actually seeing it. And I just, 
I want to go to these, you know, I don't know. I might be with Bernie, Bernie Sanders, when it's like billionaires shouldn't exist, you know, like to have a billion dollars, what, I mean, can you be, you know, reasonably ethical and be a billionaire at the same time? You know, it's a question I can't answer, but I just, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of somebody with that much money who has that need. And I wonder about their in internal organs. I wonder about their soul. I wonder about what it takes to be so relentlessly ambitious. And then you look at some of them, right? And you see, they don't want to die. They're doing everything so that they will live, they will survive above all. And, and that scares me. And I, you know, look, I'm going to die. Uh, hopefully not too soon. Um, but so, you know, end game for me. So I'm personally not as scared for the future, but I am terrified for people who are younger than me. And, you know, I just, I'm sad. Actually, maybe terrified is not even the right word. Maybe it's more sad. Maybe I'm just sad and I find it hard to bear. And I, I'm really happy to be with you guys now because I feel close to you. And I, you know, I don't know if I would do this with a big group, although maybe it would be necessary. And it's really making me think, Daniel, about wanting to open up this type of thing more within our conversations, because sometimes I get off the calls and I'm like, dazzled by the richness and, you know, levels of our conversation but emotionally just in a state of almost numbness mm. and I don't want to be numb I want to feel this life I want to enjoy this life and I don't want to do it by avoiding the things that are too distressing that's why I'm here I know a lot of people a lot of really fucking smart people who don't want to come because they don't want to they just can't bear it. It's enough with the climate emergency, you know? It's enough with the decline of democracy to be, you know, to be looking at AI. But we created this. We're responsible. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Something that really hits me from, from a piece, I mean, there are so many, so much richness there. Um, there's definitely something very pharaonic in terms of how we're doing this. A few folks acquiring just ridiculous quantities of things and figuring out how can I put all of that, you know, burn it all in whatever way needs to be so that I can be as effectively immortal as possible. Um, but. And so why? Why are they like that? Well, why Donald Trump, Donald Trump. So, and I think I think I think actually that there's a there's a really neat part for me around all of that because I mean again, um, I got to thinking, and I mean some of it related to Trump and to politics, and some of it to economic systems and folks like say an Elon Musk, um, that when you build a system that has certain tendencies of where it's going to skew energy. Um, you have inevitable things that happen. And I mean, if you're the people who are at the levers and dials of making that system, generally you try to make it so that, you know, a, a fair bit of that energy comes to you. But that um, in the same way that the levels of poverty and trauma and brokenness are an inevitable piece of where the dials are currently set, um, that when you build a system that's based off of a concept of infinite hockey stick growth as being the goal and that you make, you tweak and fine tune every piece of the system to support that happening, um, including the crashes that come with it. Cause it's fine if there's crashes, as long as you have the yeah. hockey stick growth, as long as you know when to jump out and into the different pieces. If again, if you, if you have that capacity, um, but it's, it's equally inevitable that you're going to have billionaires. It's it's something that you're, you're going to have that with the dials set the way that they are. And yeah. I, I, I say this next part, not as an apologetic 
for the approach of billionaires, <clears throat> but to say that I think that in the same way that um, toxic patriarchy damages men, I think that the level of damage that happens to people across, <laughs> across all of the different sort of class strata based off of how we have set our patterns of just vicious extraction and vicious perpetual ubiquitous continual extraction going on. Um, when you talk about that piece about healing, it's so critical um, and the piece that's missing. I mean, we're phenomenally great at healing um, given the space and time to do it. And that what we've done is create a system where that space and time is harder and harder and harder to come by. And where the level of change, whether it's, um, you know, now I have to deal with this piece that's hitting our family economically, and now I have to go out and get our next set of masks to deal with the pandemic, but now I need to balance those with the mask that I need to deal with the forest fires. And like any of these different pieces, we're just, we're hit, we're hammered so hard. Um, I think, you know, I think back to like Alvin Toffler's future shock and this kind of, you know, idea coming out of the 60s and 70s, which was powerful then, and is one of those pieces where the prediction was, if anything, um, subpar in terms of what the level of intensity of that was going to be. And it was, it was dire in terms of how it was framed then. Anyways, I feel like that's a key piece of it, is that all of these... <clears throat> Anyways, where the end point of there, so, so that I get to an end point, um, one of the pieces is I feel like we have, we have the billionaire approach that we do right now. And what I'm really interested in and would love to see the data visualization around, which isn't doable because of how carefully a lot of that information is kept private, but is, it's not just about where's the energy aggregated, but it's about where does that energy then go? Other than just into the into the the heat sink of bank accounts, um, what are the various sets of different systems which get fed by the current ecosystem that we've set up, especially the ones that are behind a walled garden that we can't really peek behind? Um, but I have I have tremendous hope. One of the things that and and, and sorry, this is I, I realize I may be over rambling here, but 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 a piece that's that that I think is relevant. Um, I mentioned to a couple of folks having this great experience of, of experimenting with using GPT to help over five or six hours in the planning around a potential festival that might happen, a large scale festival that might happen. Um, and writing what seemed from my naive perspective to be a reasonably good first pass, 120 page document covering all of these different various angles. But one of the key things was having specified right at the beginning Justice, equality, diversity, equity, inclusion are all critical and axiomatic for how this thing has to be done. And watching how in sort of a kaleidoscopic fractal way that then got reflected through every nuance of what's involved in the logistics of planning a large event gives me hope. And it gives me hope for our ability to take this Behemoth, this leviathan of policy and process and systems and government and corporate um, mess that we're currently in, um, and to be able to say, well, what what if we make these pieces axiomatic? You know, we know what's needed to survive as a species in a lot of ways. What does it look like if we take what we currently have and then say, now let's go through it systematically and percolate in those same pieces: justice, equality, inclusion, love. Um, su supportability, sustainability, the room and space to stop and heal, um, the emphasis on connection. Um, I, yeah, I, I feel like the, the, and the how it hit me coming home yesterday from the trip I was on was that we're really good as a species at driving ourselves into the middle of a fire um, and not noticing until we're there, but then trying to figure out how to get out and I have hope that the tools that we're currently making will allow us at the very late stage in the game that we're realizing maybe lemminging isn't the right thing to do, um, that we may be able to pull back from closer to the brink in a way that leaves more left over afterwards.
thanks for your patience with a very long ramble. Daniel, thank you. I'm, I, in the way you mentioned hope, uh, it made me think something that's giving me hope. You know, my focus with AI these past couple of weeks is, you know, self-directed learning for language and cognitive skills. And it's just blowing my mind how appropriate language mastery is with a large language model being the tool. Um, you know, okay, give me a bunch of examples for how I can use this word to improve my cognitive skills, but make them all about sustainable energy, right? Or make them all about, um, and, and, and I can say, okay, so in all your responses, layer meaning and puns in a way that each of your responses is like a roomy poem. And then it gives a response and I think, oh, it didn't do it. And then I go, oh, and then I see the hidden meanings that it put in. I'm like, oh, it did do it. Oh, this is fun, right? Um, and a year from now, what that's going to look like for, you know, imagine being a, a teenager, like a 17 year old who becomes interested in something. They, re they realize that they're interested in democracy or they're interested in healing modalities. And they go, oh, well, this is a lot to learn. Uh, if only I had an assistant in my learning process. And oh, wow, there's these tools that have come online or people have put together like these emerging resources in self-directed learning into like these tutor assistants that keep me in the driver's seat and really make sure I do the work that's really important for me to do um, um, or that us to do together that can be part of a team. And we have this amazing, anyway, I want to be that 17 year old, it's, but it's good enough being the you know 50 year old. But when I think about the kids today, the tools for any of them that become self-motivated um, to learn Holy crap. What? <laughs> you know, the only thing would be better would be having one of, you know, having like 24 hour access to a, a really brilliant, caring professor. Um, but almost nobody has that, right? Um, anyway, it's, I, I think it's amazing what, what we, we have and what the next generation has like starting now. I love, I love, love, love that piece of because really, <clears throat> and especially in the educational sphere, there's so much focus on. Um, I mean, there's there's focus on good parts too, but so much focus on um, what do we do about the unmotivated, unmotivated student who's using this to fake their essay and such, instead of looking at the extraordinary power that this gives people mm -hmm. to excel into the things they're passionate about. Yeah, and I, I mean, I do think that stuff is great. I just, I am concerned about uh, the social aspect. I am concerned about community. The more people that learn on their own, uh, you know, I mean, you can do both, of course, learn, you know, in a, in a classroom situation and learn on your own. I just, the more and more we do on our screens, the less and less we are with each other. And that's just a fact. And well, that's changing our brain, it's changing our heart, it's changing, it's changing everything. And and I am now I I I I I started mentioning at the beginning, I just read a book uh called The Empathy Diaries. I was literally walking on the street and there it was, and it had a little sticky on it, and it said, and it was hard copy looking brand new, and it said Adonne, which means to give. And I took it and I read it. And very quickly, and it's at memoirs of Sherry Turkle. And, you know, she's right there in the heart of innovation. And, but she's looking at it from the human perspective, from the perspective of the humanities. You know, again, we're a small group. It's bad. I don't know how to, I don't, you know, you guys are, great amazing and saying things that are lifting me and making me feel like we need to actually do an ai and us that's just centered around our hope and hear what people have people bring what they feel hopeful about but then i'd say let's do one about our fears and we'll see maybe there will be less people who will come to that <laughs> maybe not um but 
Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm Debbie Downer today. I'm I'm just uh, you know I read that book and I, on the one hand, it sort of filled me with uh, energy, and on the other hand, it destroyed me. I don't think it's Debbie Downer. I think it's it's surfacing the real component. That we what's need there to... yeah absolutely so no I, I it bringing that in is a gift don't don't ever feel bad about bringing those components and I mean again I have a lot of hope in it's funny that you know we focus on neurons and it's like you know artificial neural networks which is what this is all based on but so much of what it could become I mean in the same way that you know I always ramble about augmented rather than artificial intelligence and how do we augment our own intelligence and that artificial neural networks and LLMs can maybe function more like axons. We're the neurons. And the, the, the thing that they do is to help the right ones connect. And that that then gets really exciting. So it isn't about how do I sit in a room, get excited about democracy and have a computer teach me a thousand things. It's having a computer have enough dialogue with me to say where you're at in your learning and the direction that you're heading in and the kind of questions and motivation and level of energy and such that you're wanting to spend on this means that you should probably talk to so-and-so and this person over here because maybe you're ready for them to be people who are who you're engaging with and finding those ways to to enhance the synchronicity of connection that we get in our lives um but again we have to choose that that's not an automatic thing we have to choose to engage with the systems and to build the systems in a way that allow for that. I wanna tie uh, what I said earlier back to the human connection. Um, and um, um, cause thank you Brenda for reminding us of that so many times. So yesterday I went on a run with a very old friend um, he's a designer and an intellectual, uh, and he's in the middle of designing like a Keller wheel or a wine tasting wheel, but for scent. Um, and he wants it to be a, a resource that anybody could relate to, to let people communicate about scents. And for him, it's all kind of ties into like a mindfulness practice where he's created this habit of kind of tasting the, he also tasting the air, but he's, you know, like he's smelling the air, um, but it brings him into his environment in a way that's, that sort of grounds him in the world. Um, and we had a good talk. And one of the reasons I was able to follow along and stay engaged with him telling me about how difficult some of what he's trying to do and the difficult, you know, what he doesn't know if he'll be able to integrate in all of this it's because of what I've been learning about design language. Um, Cause he, you know, he can use some sophisticated language while he tries to describe his process. And one of the reasons I could do that is because of how, um, how what I've been doing, thanks ChatGPT is helping me absorb and click with words that are otherwise difficult for me. So, that run and being able to connect with him and, and have like a really good talk on the beach with him. Um, that human connection I just had yesterday, I could see the way the work I've been doing allowed that to happen. So I think if that is kept as the priority, as kept as the point, um, how we're able to talk to each other, how we're able to spot when we're miscommunicating. Um, how to be able to spot where all the ambiguities happen, um, how to be able to spot when language is harmful rather than helpful, um, but always prioritizing coming back to how we connect with each other. Um, if we do that, then I think these emerging things can serve us in a, a healing process and uh, a community process. Um, yeah, so just... <laughs> I, I so appreciate that. I, I I agree. And I think there's enormous, like, just outrageously enormous potential for AI to, to be used for good, or what I would consider good anyways. Um, I just... Uh, I don't know if we are healed enough to focus on that. Um, and so I I... 
yeah. Wouldn't it be glorious to have a school that was, again, using and designing some of these tools specifically in the service of that, and not only that critical thinking piece, but that piece around presence and that piece around connection, um, learning, learning <laughs> connection and diplomacy and all of its nuances in ways that, you know, schools are such a ripe opportunity to learn that isn't necessarily always capitalized on. But yeah, to be able to have that environment, because really what that's what it, so much of it is. It's about building people who've had the experiences of what some of that can look like and with the desire and feeling of feasibility of, of, of doing that. I, I, think, I think the community, I mean, with self-awareness or with connection and community, so much of it is that thing that you have to taste it in order to get what it is, and then you want more of it um, and, and sort of sense out where that is in a way that works for you. And I think, I feel like so much of it is that it's, it's about like, how do we, how do we do the stuff? How, how do we have the gatherings and bring people together and build the tools that very specifically are aimed at that and then make those open source and freely released along with the methodologies to help make those pieces happen. Um, that's a ramble. I love, I want to say, I love that today, um, two out of the three video feeds are deeply embedded in nature. Um, it's a, it's a, a lovely, uh, element to have there for, for this discussion. And can I say that I woke up this morning, first of all, so I'm here, uh, in the country alone. Uh, and, uh, um, it poured last night and it was frightening the intensity and it's been, we had like crazy heat in Montreal and now it, it then went cold. Uh, and I've been up here for all the cold <laughs> and it was wild to watch the storm last night. It was wild. The sound, the sight, you know, at, at certain points I could not see it was so, it was raining so hard. They were expecting tornadoes. I, I didn't see any of that uh, in my tiny little corner here. But when I woke up in the morning, um, there's like a little patch of grass right here outside the house. And uh, there were holes all over the garden and uh, the, the, uh, all over the that little patch, like probably about 25 holes dug. And it was uh, wild geese. And I thought, how long am I going to contemplate these geese before I turn back to my screen? Not long. Mm -hmm. Debbie Downer. <laughs> Brenda, I, I support and admire you in feeling all those things because it's, it's brave to open to um, how um yeah to you know there's there's things happening that are of grave concern um and there's a lot of suffering and it takes a lot of courage to to uh to see that and feel all the emotions that have to arise with that so thank you and i imagine yeah. for sherry turkle like you know, brilliant genius that she is and uh, being at MIT, they didn't want to give her tenure. She fought it and she won. And, but she's sort of the internal critic at MIT. Mm. And back in the day, they really didn't want to hear what she had to say. I'm sure there were some who, you know, there, there were definitely some who strongly supported her, but there was a lot, it went counterculture uh, at, a, at a, you know, such a hallowed hall of technology and science as MIT. And, you know, we're not listening. She talked about how engineer culture um, has affected us so deeply. And um, so we think more in terms of black and white and, uh, and how, how dangerous that is for humanity. Um, yeah, and uh, God, here, here I am doing it again, uh, but, but nonetheless, we're all gonna die. So, you know, we just do the best that we can while we're here and uh, celebrate 
our lives and each other and ourselves if we're if we can and uh continue to ride this unbelievable i don't i don't know what to call ai you know like it, it, it's not a movement it's not it's 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 what is it what is it we don't even know what is artificial super intelligence it's coming I'll quickly um, <clears throat> just share this piece from Zach. So saying, uh, love these connections, not my inability to work in quiet places. As for AI, like most things, I'm feeling conflicted. It's super helpful as an adhd -er, uh to wrangle the billion strands coexisting in my mind into a coherent dissertation and definitely makes academic discourse more accessible for the nonlinear folk. But I think this is just a makeshift solution to a larger systemic issue arising from a competitive research environment that privileges outputs rather than non-reductionist understandings of complex humans and stuff. Plus, if I couldn't train uh, it on my body of work, it would basically spit out meaningless, good sounding words. But yes, we need community to interrupt our linear thoughts to bring the other into our attention. Thanks, Zach, for that. Thanks, Zach. Great to have you here. Ah. <laughs> I like listening to you guys. It's good for me. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. That's wonderful. Oh, you guys. I'm feeling all the feels. Likewise. Thank you. For me, this is a wonderful affirmation of, uh, you know, it's, it's like back from in the, the yogic days where you sort of like, if nobody comes, you just do the practice. If a few of you come, you do the practice. If loads of people come, you do the practice. I think these conversations, when they're small, when they're large, but when they're small, this is really our first chance to see what's that like uh, for this modality. Um, and it's great. I think that that the right people come each time and we get to to traverse the ground that those people bring so so thank you each i really appreciate i'm I'm going into the day reflective and grounded and feeling present um and and i'm grateful for the ways that this conversation has helped inform that thanks daniel i like the squirrel behind you nick there it looks <laughs> Oh, that's, sweet. that's so sweet mm. all right well, have, a weekend. have a fantastic afternoon you guys and a great weekend and hope to see you again in two weeks okay bye everybody thanks bye thank you